How y'all doing? Good. Uh, God is good, isn't he? I'll tell you, I didn't know true love until I met Jesus. And um, yeah, I'm not a a, a professional speaker, so bear with me. I um, only failed speech class once, but um, true story. And actually, during that speech class, I actually told the whole class to look down the whole time while I told my speech. And uh, I got through it, but not good enough. I still failed. Um, so, oh man, I'm going to tell you all about how Jesus saved my life and I received the gift of salvation from him uh, so growing up growing up um, I always knew who Jesus was uh, as a kid you know my grandparents they you know went to church very often they were part of you know Livingstone's church and, um, you know, my family, they, they were always, you know, believers. And so when I was a little kid, you know, I used to always go out there to live in Stones and uh, hang out with all the kids after, uh, on Wednesday nights. And, um, but, of course, I was just looking forward to playing games afterwards. Uh, I didn't really pay attention, so I didn't know much about the stories. I didn't know much about Jesus. Um, but my family has a strong background, and um, well, so let's say growing up, I um, I started in high school. So when I started high school, I um, I didn't have you know a ton of friends when I first started high school, and. Uh, I was one of those people that wanted to be accepted. I wanted to be liked. I wanted people to like me and wanted to have friends. And um, so what does, you know, at least most kids that I knew would do was uh, want to be part of the norm, today's norm in society, which, you know, what did I do? I started partying. And the more I started partying, the more I started going out and, and drinking, and uh, I became affiliated with most of the high school kids that I know that did that. And so I uh, gained a lot of friends, more popularity out of it, and um, so it really started there. Um, started smoking weed, uh, thinking, well, first time I tried it was in sixth grade, but uh, after that, I didn't really smoke until high school, and um, I got into high school, and so I'm partying, I'm smoking, all this and that, didn't know Jesus, didn't care to know Jesus, and um, I was just focused on me, and well, after high school, I got into, um, started going to college, and it just got worse from there, so, you know, being a college student, what did you do? You go around partying every weekend. That's what I lived for, was to get drunk and, uh, you know, smoke weed and just have fun, you know. And so, um, but I still, that's, and the reason I was doing these things is because I didn't know what my life was going to hold in the future. I didn't know where I was going. I knew nothing. I didn't know if I was going to, you know, become really anything. I had a lot of doubt in myself, a lot of uh, depression, um, anxiety, always worried about stuff. And so drinking, doing drugs, that was a way to cope, a way to um, get out of that depression, anxiety, and it, and it gave me uh, satisfaction for a moment. And, um, but it never solved the problem. And it never solved the problem of, you know, that the, the roots to my depression and anxiety and stuff. So, uh, you know, I was one of those kids that, you know, had a lot of friends out of other colleges. And um, they would call me, and on the drop of a dime, I'm going to, call to this college. I remember one night I was talking to my 
a friend on the phone. He's like, hey, come up to San Marcos. It's like 9.30 at night. Uh, we're partying. And I mean, it takes like three hours to get there. So everything would have been really closed by the time I got there. But I said, I'm on my way. I packed my bags. I said, Mom, I'm going to San Marcos. And uh, she kind of flipped out. She was like, what are you talking about? What do you mean you're going to San Marcos? 9.30 at night. And so, uh, yeah, I ended up going. And um, got there. Everything was closed. It was a waste of time. But um, so I did a lot of that. I went to Texas Tech, you know, um, San Marcos, A&M, down to Corpus, just always going to where the party's at. And um, just trying to fill those voids in my life. And so doing that for years, I let's get up to about 2014. It was the beginning of 2014. I had a friend that lived in San Marcos. Uh, his name was Glenn. Well, he ended up moving back to Houston. And um, when he did, we started hanging out a lot and became really good friends. And so I didn't... Um, So we, yeah, we were hanging out a lot, and uh, we became really good friends. And um, I guess we we were both kind of like he he was. We were both kind of in this boat, like you know, well, what's next? What's coming next? And well, I was tired of always being hungover, always feeling like crud, you know, and um, always just trying to put something on top of these emotions, just cover them up and not really deal with them. And so. I always, I just had this feeling, like I, I really felt God tugging at my heart and saying, you know, there, there's more, there's more, I want more for you. And um, so I was like, okay, God, show me, show me what you have for me. And so for three months, I called all my friends and I told them, hey, I don't want y'all to call me, I don't want y'all to contact me. I just want it to be me, me and God, I'm going to stay by myself for a while. And um, so the only two friends that I kept was Glenn and Ethan. This guy right here, he's been through it all with me. And uh, so, man, those first three months, it was literally every single day I would wake up, and I, I didn't, I wasn't working at the time. I, that semester, I stopped working at my grandfather's uh, company. And so I'd wake up, I got class like around 11. So all morning long, I would just get in the Word. I would read, 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 and I, I couldn't understand it. And so I would just pray and pray. I'm like, Lord, fill me up with your spirit. I want to be able to understand your word. And I'll tell you, he gave me understanding. He gave me the wisdom that I was seeking. And so every day I would just pray. And so many amazing things were happening in my life. I mean, so many things I was feeling, so many things I was seeing. Um, for example, one night that we were at, uh, yeah, we were at the ACC track, and you know, God was doing all these things in our lives. And uh, his, too, he was going through some stuff, too, that, you know, God was really opening up to him about. And um, so we go to the ACC track, and we're talking, we're walking. It's like 1130 at night, and we're coming around the back circle, and it's dark. And I said, Ethan, I said, man, I've never done this before, but do you want to just, just pray out to God right now, out in the open, out loud, do you want to pray to God and just thank him for everything that he's doing in our lives, everything that he's doing for us? And he's like, yeah, okay, let's do it. So we start praying. We're like, God, thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing for us. Thank you for everything that you're showing us, giving us this wisdom, this knowledge, and um, for, you know, saving us from these this lifestyle that was going to take us to hell, you know? And... Um, as we're doing that, I said, God, I know this is wrong of me to ask this of you, but can you just show us, can you just show us that you are here with us right now? Just right now, give us a sign. Give us something. Just let us know that you are here. And next thing you know, me and him, we just get filled up with the Holy Spirit on the spot, and we just start giggling. We're laughing like little girls, you know, and I'm like... I'm like, hey, are you feeling this? And he's like, yeah, man, what's going on? And I was like, dude, the Holy Spirit's filling us up, you know. And so, anyways, we, um, we're, as we're walking, it was cold night. There was no wind at all. So we're filled up with the Holy Spirit, man. We're just laughing. We're like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. And next thing you know, there's a cool, I mean, a, a warm breeze. 
It was cold. There was no breeze. And a warm breeze started blowing and hit us as we're walking in this. And then we're just like, oh, my gosh, what's going on? You know, it's amazing. And then he's like, whoa, look up at that star. And there's a star right above us. And it was just flashing. It was blue, bright blue, just flashing. And it just got bigger and bigger and brighter and brighter. And we saw this big aura around the star in the sky. And honestly, I don't know how all of Alvin didn't see it because stars don't do that. It was amazing. And so we're just filled up with the Holy Spirit. We have a warm breeze blowing. The star is just like flashing out to us. And we're just in shock. And then all of a sudden, all three of those feelings, everything just went away all at once. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this was amazing. What do we do? So we just dropped to our knees, and we're praying. We're crying. We're thanking God because he showed us that he was there with us that night. And, yeah, that was amazing. Uh, and so... So, um, yeah, so, like I said, everything was just going my way. You know, God was answering all these prayers. He was, you know, giving me new friends, doing new things in my life that I've never experienced before. And so I, um, I hit this one situation. There's a situation that happened that didn't happen that just kind of went against everything that I was moving forward with and in all honesty it was a blessing now I see it now I understand that that was a blessing that it happened but when it happened I didn't see it that way I was younger in my walk with God and so I got mad I got bitter and um, I had some old friends and what a convenient time I had some old friends kind of pop back up in my life at that like right at that same time you know and um, the guy I mean the devil saw an open door you know he saw okay I can get him with this and so that's what he did he just kind of moved some people around and next thing you know I end up going to uh, uh, oh you know what I missed one part before this. It was actually uh, about six, probably, no, about a year before this. I was out partying uh, at a club in Houston. I was out with some friends. We were at a hotel room. Ended up uh, getting in a scuffle with somebody and uh, had to leave the hotel room. And so I get a taxi home. Couldn't stay there. I get a taxi home. And um, I get home and realize, oh, well, I left my phone and my keys. All I have is my wallet, and I'm by myself. So I go up to my door. No one's home. Can't get in. And so I decide, okay, I'm going to um, start walking to my friend Jesse's house. And I'm, I'm blitzed. I'm drunk. And so I start walking. Actually, I start jogging. I thought that would be a good idea to get me there faster. Uh, <laughs> And I'm, I'm about blacked out drunk, so I start jogging, and I get, I live right here in this neighborhood. I get over here, about right here at those stop signs, and I'm huffing and puffing, about to pass out, and so I'm like, okay, I can't jog. What do I do? And uh, I get over here by this church. I'm like, man, if a cop sees me, I'm going to get stopped, and I'm going to get pulled over, or, you know, I'm going to go to jail, and that's the last thing that I wanted to do was go to jail. And so I was trying to do the right thing by uh, kind of hiding out. So I look over here, I'm like, okay, I need to hide out so the cops don't get me, you know? <laughs> and I said, I'm just gonna hide out till morning, I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna go to my friend Jesse's house, it'll all be well. So uh, I'm walking in front of this church and um, I see some bushes. And I'm like, huh. I'm like, no, I don't want to get wet. That's a bad idea. And I see a truck. And it was an old, I think, gray Dodge Ram pickup. And, man, that truck is always sitting there. It never moves. And so I'm like, oh, no one's ever going to go check in it. And so uh, I'm like, all right. So I go over there, un let go of the tailgate, and uh, hop in the bed of the truck. I'm like, okay, I'm going to hide out till morning. So I try to stay up. Well, I pass out. I'm out. I'm, my arms are spread out like this. I'm I'm done. 
And uh, next thing you know, I, I wake up to a knock on the side of the truck. And I look up, it's a police officer. I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay. And I was still kind of too drunk to really talk to him. But um, so I get up and he's like, all right, well. And I didn't really see who the pastor of the church was. Uh, all I saw was it, it was a Hispanic man and uh, he called the cops on me so I was a little angry and thinking in my mind why didn't he just wake me up so I could go home I'm a nice guy I would never harm anybody <laughs> and uh, so anyways the cop says alright we're going to take you home so he drives me to my house get over there can't get in and I, there's like three other places I could have gotten to drop me off at but I just I was drunk so I wasn't thinking and so they ended up taking me to jail and uh, I was there for just like maybe a day and um, got out. It was off my record, nothing. They didn't really charge me with anything. And so uh, anyways, that's just an important piece to this testimony. So I remember that story. Anyway, so we're going back to um, going back to 2014 after God had revealed himself to me and who he was and I got saved and so after that there was you know a lot of stuff that just stopped going my way I'm thinking all right God it's me and you we're gonna continue going we're gonna go strong I'm gonna be this man of God nothing's gonna come against me well I, I like I said I was young in my faith so I wasn't prepared I wasn't um I eventually stopped getting in the Word, and that's how it happened every single time in my life. Every time I got out of the Word of God, I started feeding my flesh again, and my spirit started getting weak. And so every time that, every time I do that, that's whenever you start kind of just falling back just a little more, a little more, a little more. And that just shows you the importance of being in the Word of God to keep you strong to, you know, when things come your way, the devil's going to come after you. Uh, you know, he's relentless. And if he sees a, uh, a, a door that he can slide his foot in, he's going to. Um, but anyway, so like I said, some friends kind of came back, and I ended up going out that night. And, um, well, I go out to a bar uh, called Sherlock's, and I had about five drinks too many, and uh, they are mixed drinks, so, you know, it wasn't a beer. It was pretty strong. And uh, stupid enough, I get in my car and I start driving home. Well, I'm with a friend of mine and it's just me and her, we're driving and I get up into Friendswood and I realize, okay, I'm way too drunk right now. I need to pull over and uh, get somebody to come pick us up. So again, I was trying to do the right thing. Um, <laughs> I guess the right thing would have been not to get in the car, but... Uh, Anyway, so I pull up to the light, and I'm in the turn lane, and um, I'm like, hey, call your friends, tell them to come pick us up, I don't want to drive anymore, I'm too drunk, <laughs> and so I'm sitting in the driver's seat, and light turns red, I'm sitting there, and I said, hey, let me know whenever the light turns green, so I laid my head back, closed my eyes, I was, I was tired, I was drunk, uh, so... I lay my head back, close my eyes. Next thing I know, I wake up to a police officer shaking me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what just happened? So I look over, I'm like, hey, so-and-so, we just got caught, wake up. And um, she, uh, she wakes up and the officer's like, okay, we'll drive over here to this parking lot. I'm gonna do some tests on you. And um, which I can't, oh no, no, he didn't let me drive. Sorry. He put me in the back of the cop car. He drove my car. So, anyways, I go to the parking lot. He's doing these tests, and in my mind, oh, man, I'm acing them. I mean, I'm walking f one foot in front of the other. They're not getting me. I'm going home. He puts me in handcuffs. He ends up taking me to jail. And um, so I go to a Friendswood jail, and I'm in there for, like, two days or so. Well, as soon as I get in there, I'm freaking out. I'm like, oh, I ruined my life, you know. Whole life, my mom told me, you go to jail for DWI, you're finished. You're done. There ain't no coming back from that. And, well, that's what I thought. I don't know. I was, it was probably the alcohol, too. And just like, you know, 
She actually kept me from smoking weed for a long time because she used to tell me one hit would kill you. And so for years, I wouldn't even touch the stuff. And um, yeah, so <laughs> funny. Um, anyway, so yeah, I'm in jail. And as soon as I get in there, I'm pacing back and forth in the jail cell. I'm freaking out like, God, what did I do? Why did I do this? We were going so strong. I was doing so good. And, and I failed. I failed you. What? Why? 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 Why does this have to happen? And, you know, I realized it wasn't him. It was me who stepped away. He didn't step away. He's always there. I'm the one who stepped away because I got out of the word. I didn't keep the armor of God on me. And um, you'll see that this happens many times. It becomes a pattern. And, um, well, so anyways, I get a DWI, and um, after that, oh, well, I remember I called my dad. First person I called, I was terrified. I don't know why I called him. I thought he was going to be so mad. And, uh, but he was the best person I probably, you know, probably called because as soon as I answered, man, he was, he was so loving. He was so understanding. And he said, son, don't worry about it. You made a mistake. You're going to learn from it. He said, I'm going to get, you know, go to a bell bondsman in the, in the morning and everything's going to be all right. And that gave me some peace that night. And, uh, man, jails are dirty, too. They're disgusting. I'm not made for jail. Uh, it stunk. They didn't give us toothbrushes, nothing. Uh, and they did feed us Sonic, so that was all right. Uh, but anyways... So, yeah, so after that happened, um, after that happened, I'm kind of in this lukewarm on the fence with God, and I ended up telling him, uh, telling him that I wanted a relationship. And it was kind of out of nowhere. I'm like, okay, well, I can't find happiness maybe this will make me happy or well I found it in him but once I strayed away I would just keep on going back to things try other little things to but instead of going back to Christ which I knew was the only way and uh, so I ended up all of a sudden getting this girlfriend and um, man we immediately started that relationship off wrong you know we didn't put God first uh I allowed her to move in with me, and man, after that, the relationship was just a lot of fighting, a lot of heartache, a lot of stress. It was just, it was horrible, you know, and I got to a point, and um, I got to a point, and I'm like, God, why is this not working? And he told me, you know, because I didn't put him in it. I'm, you know, I'm doing it in my own will. I'm not in his will right now. And so I'm like, okay, God, the only way this is going to work is if I put you first. So help me do this. Help me fix this. And so I put him first, and I start going to church by myself for a little bit. And uh, there's a church and friends with that uh, I've gone to on and off throughout the years. Even whenever I was, you know, partying and stuff, I was going to church. But, and, and that's the thing. A lot of people you know I wasn't getting attacked all the all the problems that were happening in my life were because of me it was all because of the choices and decisions I was making and a lot of people do blame all their problems on the devil the devil well sometimes it's just our stupidity and um, most of the time it, it was mine and you know I'll tell you whenever I found Christ whenever I truly started walking in Christ daily that's whenever I started um seeing a different side to um, the enemy attacking you and the enemy coming after you because you're walking in Christ. You know, he doesn't, he sees you as a threat now. A lot of people, you can go to church, you can praise God, you can read the Bible, but the devil don't really care if you do those things. He just doesn't want you to apply them to your life. And once you start applying those things to your life every single day, surrendering to him daily and just giving him your all, that's whenever the devil's really going to attack you. That's whenever you're going to experience things that a lot of people aren't going to understand. Um, you know, and 
have that problem. Just a lot of people don't understand the things. And uh, I'm sure there's many of you that understand or that go through the same thing, you know. But anyway, so I was saying I was with her. I uh, started going to church, and um, God, I just put my eyes on him, and I'm like, God, I'm yours. And, man, I just had a peace. I had a happiness that I haven't had in a long time. And he ended up uh, telling me, uh, you need to ask her to move out. And uh, I'm like, really? And that's the last thing I wanted. I wanted to live with her. I, you know, I liked her. I wanted to live with her. But um, God told me. He convicted me. He said, you got to ask her to move out. I didn't talk to anyone about it. It was God told, that told me this. Uh, and I'm like, okay, God, I'm going to listen to you because I know this is the only way that's going to work. So. I ended up at, uh, sitting down with her, asking her, hey, can you, you know, I want this to work, but we have to put God first. Um, I feel convicted about us living together before marriage. I think we need to, you need to move out. Well, that was the wrong thing to say. <laughs> that was, that was, um, it was not the right thing to say at that time. And so, uh uh, it was just a lot of fighting and bickering, and uh, and I, and the more I was focused on Christ and less on the relationship and all the problems, the more I was able to handle them without getting angry, without getting frustrated. And so, whenever all that was happening, I was like, "Okay, look, I'm trying to make this work. Let's put God first. If you want this to work, we got to do this for God. I'm not doing this because I want it. I'm doing it because I want Jesus and I want Him to." you know, be the head of this relationship, so uh, we did it, uh, tried to make it work, and I tried to, you know, be over there in as much as I could um, to kind of, because I knew it would, that's kind of, that would be tough on somebody to live with somebody and then separate, but um, it just, it was more fighting than anything, and God's just like, let it go, let it go, and um, I remember actually going to her house one day, and the Lord said, I'm over there, I'm like, God, should I go? Should I not? And he so clearly, it, it was almost audible, he said, go home. Go home. Well, what do I do? I don't go home. I go over there and end up getting back in it once again. And Well, the thing was, God was just trying to protect me from just prolonging this relationship that wasn't going to last because God has so much. He, it wasn't going to last for both of us, you know. He had better plans for me. He had better plans for her. And so... Anyways, that ended up going, and after that, um, it was just me and God. I'm just I'm trying to get back in. I'm trying to, you know, um, walk right, but I'm also still struggling. You know, I'm going to this church, and and I finally, uh, I'm trying to be a part of this church, and um, I'm like, hey, I want to serve. You know what? And um, I couldn't find a spot. They wouldn't help me serve. They wouldn't help me be a part of that church, and I didn't understand why. And um, so that made it a little tougher, you know, because you need a family. You need a church family that, you know, that comes together, that communes, that fellowships, or you're going to have, you know, a big struggle in your life because, um, you know, you're not going to see a successful lone Christian. We're called the body of Christ for a reason. Um, Jesus had disciples. He wasn't alone. And uh, anyway, so about that time, I ended up, uh, you know, my relationship's just a little lukewarm with God, but I'm, I'm trying to get back on track with him like I was before. Uh, then comes around to 2015, I ended up getting this job. I went to college, graduated, ended up getting this job uh, with this company called Marathon. And uh, I'm like, and I prayed for it so hard. And I'm like, all right, God, it's me and you. We're going to do this. We're going to get through this. Um, you know, we're going to, I know you're going to see me through all this. And this whole time since 2014 till now, there's one thing that I always told God that no matter what happens, I would never give up. I would never quit trying. I would never quit moving forward, no matter how many times I fell. And um, so I get this job. I start making all this money that, you know, more than I've ever had before. And 
Then all of a sudden, when the money comes, my friends comes, a girlfriend comes, partying again. And uh, man, so I really had everything that I would want as a worldly person, you know, living in the world for the world. I had everything that I wanted, but I had also that pulled me farther away from Christ once again, and I just had a void. I had everything I wanted, no problems, I wasn't, but there's just still something inside of me that was just so empty. You know, the things of this world are not going to fill that void that only Jesus can fill. And um, so I ended up uh, asking God and breaking down one day, like, why? Why is my life not getting better? Why do I keep going back and forth? Why can't I get it right? Uh, you know, and this whole time, he's just teaching me things little by little. And I said, Lord, I said, whatever is in my life right now that is hindering me from getting closer to you, whatever is keeping me from moving in your will and being in your will, and that keeps pulling me back into the world, take it out of my life. I don't want it anymore. I want no part of it. Well, next thing you know, over the next few months, my job went my girlfriend went then all my friends went and um, that wasn't no coincidence you know that was God and um, I wasn't upset I, I was actually really happy whenever all that happened I wasn't mad at all I was happy because I knew it was God and I knew it was for the good for for me and uh, so I get around to that summer 2016 and God, I'm going to this church in Friendswood, and God told me, he said, find another church. And I didn't understand why, because I liked that church, I really did. But at the same time, there was also something that, like, I, I knew that the, there, I just wanted a church that was just filled with the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit moved, that I just, that I could connect with, with the people. You know, it was more of a church that you go in, you leave, you know, um, you don't really fellowship with people. And that, I mean, that's in the word of God. We're to fellowship. We're to be the body of Christ together. And so he said, find another church. And I'm like, okay, God, I'll find another church. And so all these other churches I was thinking about going to, the last one that I thought about going to uh, was the first one I ended up going to. It was a church that I went to as a kid. And, uh, I ended up going there, and the first sermon that I heard, every question that was on my mind was answered in that one sermon. I had so many questions, and everything was answered in that one sermon. I'm like, okay, God, I see you. I know this is where you want me to be. And uh, so I go talk to the pastor and kind of tell him my testimony, tell him what I'm going through. And, and by this time, I had already felt in my heart that I was called to ministry in some way. I mean, we're all called to ministry. We're all supposed to have our own ministry. We're all called to go and spread the good news, spread God's word, tell them about the gift that he has freely given us if we would accept it, of salvation. But I just had it in my heart that I was going to be in ministry one day. And so I'm telling him this, and he's like, okay, that's great. You know, uh, we got some young adults groups. You know, you can go be in those. And it wasn't really what I was looking for. I've always felt like I was kind of looking for a mentor, somebody that I can really just connect with that can teach me how to be this man of God, how to walk, you know, in Christ faithfully, you know, and, um, but I was like, okay, that's great, I'll go do this, so I went and got in the young adults group, and man, the people were great, I loved them, uh, I, I loved them, and they were, um, I was hanging out with them all the time, and well, I just started noticing that it was more of a hangout than truly learning about Christ, truly spending the time that we, you know, whenever we had have our young adults nights, we were just hanging out, and which is great, you know, we're having fellowship time, we're hanging out, and that's great. We weren't doing, you know, anything, uh, s you know, sinful, but we weren't ever really learning about Christ. And that's what I wanted. I knew that's what's going to help me get in to where God wants me to be. And so I'm going there. And then I, I find myself starting to 
kind of fade back away again just a little bit. And then uh, comes around 2016, December, I was actually, right before New Year's, a week before New Year's, I was warned about old, um, old friends coming back into my life. Well, next thing you know, the next week, an old friend comes back into my life. And uh, I'm like, okay, maybe I can help him. Maybe I can help him come to Christ, you know, thinking that I was strong enough to be able to go out into that world that God saved me from whenever I haven't even built roots myself. And so and I'm going out. Uh, first night, didn't do nothing. Second night, compensated. Oh, I'll have a beer. So start having a beer, and then after that, just got just kind of snowball effect. And well, later on that year, my mom, she ended up having a major heart attack. Uh, and my what, one of her smaller arteries was clogged like 100%, large artery was clogged 90%. It was, it was pretty bad. And, uh, you know, that really scared me. And because uh, I don't know what I'd do without my mom. You know, she's taken care of me my whole life. So I ended up uh, kind of falling even harder. I'd already went back into that sm snowball effect, but then it, that just scared me so bad, and I just ended up going back into drinking and then full-out party mode. So I'm partying hard. I'm going to clubs. I'm going to bars. I'm getting drunk all the time, blacked out drunk, and it's it was almost worse than what it was before. You know, I wasn't doing drugs anymore. I wasn't smoking weed anymore. I quit that uh, so I could get that job at Marathon. But um, anyways, but I started back drinking again. Uh, so I end up going to um, or end up coming 2017 comes the summer and the whole time I'm dealing with conviction. I'm dealing with the devil condemning me and making me feel like, oh, I can't go back. You know, you've gone too far. God doesn't want you anymore. And, and But, you know, I knew that wasn't the truth. I knew that was just the devil just trying to scare me, just trying to keep me down, and that's what he does. He's just, no matter what you do, he's going to continue to pull you down and to break you. And that's, but you have to just keep going. You gotta keep moving forward. And so that's what I did. And so about summertime, I end up, I'm struggling. I'm like, God, I need you. I need you. I, I'm, I'm done. I keep going back and forth. Why do I keep going back and forth? Why am I so weak? And uh, so, and anyways, I end up meeting a man named by uh, Rabbi Ron. And he, uh, he was over at my grandparents' house one day. And so my grandparents ended up, uh, or my mom ended up calling me saying, hey, Rabbi Ron's over here. You should come talk to him. Well, I didn't really know him, but I knew that at that moment I needed to go talk to this man. So I haul butt over there. Um, I'm praying because I knew he wasn't going to wait for me. So uh, every single light was green the whole way over there. It's never been like that before. And, uh, yeah. So anyways, I get over there, and I'm like, hey, Rabbi, uh, let's talk. And he said, okay. He says, you want to talk? And he said, do you want a relationship with God that you've never had before? Do you want to be able to hear him and never miss him? And I said, yes, of course. And, uh, well, he said, okay, be at my house by 530 Wednesday morning. And uh, before work, I said, okay, I'll be there. So... I ended up going there, and um, oh no, before that, uh, that Tuesday, he said, hey, I want you to come out to prayer night with me. So I go to this prayer night and ended up seeing Pastor Michael. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know who any of the pastors were, but I was there, and um, I just had this gravitational pull. I felt like I needed to talk to this man. I had no clue who he was, but out of all, everyone there, I just wanted to talk to him. So I ended up going to the front and praying at the altar, and I feel somebody put his hand on me. I look up, and, well, it was that pastor. It was Pastor Mark. And so I'm like, okay, uh, I really want to talk to him. So Wednesday morning, the next day, I end up getting over to Rabbi's house at 
uh, 5.15, because he said, if you're late, don't show up. And uh, so, so yeah, I got, I got there early. And, uh, and this is after, uh, I forgot to tell you, but this is after um, I'd had one drunken night that really just set me over the edge where I just broke down crying. Like, I, I, I was tired. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I don't know if y'all been there. Like, just you're just, you're tired of falling and falling and falling and falling, and you just, God, I don't want this lifestyle anymore. I don't want any part of it. I want you. You're the only one that can heal me. You're the only one that can help me. You're the only thing that matters to me. And so that's whenever he told me, he said, Tyler, you can't be on the fence anymore. He says, you've been around the fence too long. He said, there's no lukewarm. He says, either you're for me or you're against me. I mean, it was almost like an ultimatum. Well, it was an ultimatum. And he said, you know, you can't do this no longer. And I don't know what would have happened if I would have continued down that path, if I would have died or if I would have, you know, driven drunk one too many times and killed somebody. You know, I don't know. But anyway, so I finally said, God, I'm yours. I said, take everything. I don't want it. I don't want any part of this world. I want you. And um, I'm, I, and I tell him, and I still tell him this almost every day, Lord, whatever it takes for me to be the man that you created me to be, may it be done. Do it. Whatever it takes. And I know I, I've told people that, and they kind of open their eyes real big, like, oh, that's kind of that's kind of scary prayer to say, you know. And uh, it is. I mean, I know it's going to be tough. I know it's going to be hard, but I don't care. I know it's going to glorify God, and I know that it's the best choice you'll ever make. And so uh, I told him, yeah, do whatever it takes. And so anyways, then that's whenever I met Rabbi. So, um, so yeah, I started coming here, and uh, or no, yeah, I met Rabbi, and he said, oh, hey, you know, um, if there's a church that I could direct you to, he said it would be uh, Pastor Michael at Grace Community Church. And I'm like, oh, who's that? Well, it happened to be the pastor that God put on my heart to go speak to. And I didn't know that at the time, but I realized, oh, that's him. God put me on God put him on my heart. Like, it's just crazy how everything was just stacking up, how everything was being put in place, and that's only by the hand of God. And so um, I'm like, okay, I got to go talk to this man. So I come over here, and I realize what church he's at. <laughs> oh, man. I, as soon as I pulled up, I started sweating. Oh. I was nervous. I'm like, I don't know if this man knows me. I don't know, because I didn't see the man's face. I just, I didn't even know if uh, he was the pastor at the time. But, uh, so anyways, I go here, I tell my testimony, tell him, you know, how I just, I've always felt looked over. I felt like people don't take me serious. And I said, but there's one thing I'm serious about, even though I mess up so much, I'm serious about God. And I know God's serious about me, and I want to do whatever it takes to be what he created me to be. And, um, and he said, he, he told me, he said, Tyler, you know, there's one thing that I'll never do is I'll never overlook you. He says, uh, you know, there's many churches out there that want to get numbers in, get people in, get people in, get the masses in, but he says, you know, what I want is people that are serious about Christ, that want to know him, that want to love him, that want to serve him and serve the people of God. I want to build them up and make them disciples and get out there spreading God's word. And, and I said, that's what I'm looking for. And so God ended up blessing me with two of some of the best mentors I could ever have. And, um, yeah, so anyways, uh, so yeah, if you, I'm coming here after a few weeks, and um, I'm thinking, man, should I tell Pastor about that night? I don't know if he knows me. I don't know if he was the pastor at the time, and so I didn't tell him. I even asked my mom because my mom knew she was laughing, and uh, she's like, "Yeah, go for it." And I'm like, "Okay." So uh, I was like, "You know what? They're not gonna judge me. We're all sinners. We've all made mistakes." So I said, "You know what? I'm, I'm gonna tell them." So one uh, Wednesday night we're having Bible study and I, we're in the back and then God tells me uh, 
like, because I almost didn't do it, but he told me, he said, go tell him. So I get up and I go uh, right whenever we let out. Everyone's still in the room. We go out to the doorway, and I'm like, hey, Pastor Michael. I said, do you remember a guy that may have passed out in the bed of your uh, A pickup truck out here in the church parking lot? And he's looking, and he's like, yeah, yeah, I do. And I didn't say nothing. I just kind of smiled a little bit. I was nervous, but I smiled. And he's like, no, that was you? And I'm like, yeah, that was me. And he's like, oh, my gosh. He says, everybody knows about you. He said, <laughs> he said wait till I tell everybody. I'm like, no. So literally every person that was walking out to leave from uh, prayer night or um, Wednesday night Bible study, he literally stopped and said, you remember that young man that was drunk, passed out in the bed of that pickup? That was him. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. And so it was honestly, it was really funny. And uh, he tells me, he's like, Tyler, he says, you know how amazing that is? He said, that night, I told, or, or that morning, God told the whole church about what happened. And I told them that, you, that we need to pray for this man. We need to pray for his salvation. We need to pray that he finds a good Bible-believing church. And that he uses this as his testimony. And, uh, yeah, that's exactly what happened. So, so um, yeah. But, yeah, praise God. He, uh, he led me exactly where he wanted me to be, and, and I'm here. And um, everyone, everyone here is such a blessing, you know. Everyone here is... Uh, my family I mean every Sunday we go back there and eat and fellowship with each other and it's it's never been like that at any other church that I've been to but that's what God wants it to be and uh, I'll tell you you're never you're always going to struggle if you don't have a family to hold you together a family in Christ that are going to help lift you up and help you to you know move past the struggles you know um we're all we, we can all be weak sometimes, but you know if we you know have Christ, we got to put on the armor of God and and also have a family that's going to lift us up in the hard times and be there for us. And I'll tell you, I went through a lot of th this year that I've been here at this church. It's been a struggle. It's been a struggle to to walk in Christ. It's the best decision I ever made. But the devil saw I was serious. The devil saw that I wanted to be everything that he created me to be and that I would never give up. And even though I still fell, I'm never going to give up. And um, so he, you know, he, of course, he went to, uh, went to work on me as best he could. And I'll tell you, um, my grandmother, uh, God bless her, she, um, she was a huge blessing. She, she was a prayer warrior in our family. My grandmother and my grandfather, uh, they were prayer warriors, and, and I believe that their prayers were some of the prayers that probably kept me alive. <laughs> Amen. And um, they, yeah, they're such a blessing in my life. I, I couldn't ask for better grandparents. And so, um, yeah, after she, she passed away this past December, it was a little rough, and uh, I just kind of hit this rut. And there's, you know, just multiple ways that the devil was just trying to get to me and uh, using that as a weak, you, you know, using me being weak at that moment. And, um, but so I was in this rut for a little bit, but then God, uh, you know, God always shows up. He's always there. He's always there to lift me up and he lifted me up. And, um, if I was in that rut a year ago, if I was in that rut and wasn't at this church with a family that was there to support me, you know, they all did. They were all there for me. And, uh, if I didn't have that that strong foundation at this church or you know and have God to help me build the foundation that I've built so far I would have been back in the world I would have been back drinking but I didn't so that to me is proving my growth it's proving my growth in Christ and um, I'm going to continue to grow and I'm going to continue to press on and I'm going to continue to proclaim God's word everywhere I go and tell people about Jesus so yeah so, uh, yeah, that, that was the uh, story of how Jesus saved me. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord.
We thank you, God. We thank you for this day. And we thank you for everything that you have done for us, that no matter how many times we have failed you and gone back and forth, and we can be double-minded sometimes, but Lord, deliver us from the double-mindedness. Lord, help us get out of out of this the the grips of this world, Lord, that it's not about the world and the things of this world, Lord, but it's about you. It's about proclaiming your name. It's about becoming the person that you created us all to be. We're all meant to be part of the body of Christ. We're all meant to be, you know, we're all meant to be in ministry and spread the word of God, Lord. And so I pray, I pray for everyone out there struggling, everyone out there that has gone through maybe some of the similar things that I've gone through, uh, I encourage them to just keep going. Don't ever give up. Don't stop. God is there. He will see you through everything that you're going through. If you just stay obedient and you stay in line in his will and you just stay, just stay in him, keep your eyes on him. He'll see you through it. And Lord, I, so I, I pray that you just bless everyone here, Lord, that you just give them a fr fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit, God, and you and you show them, you work in their hearts and show them that they are meant to be so much more, that you call them for so much more, and that, that you're going to continue to take them into everything that you want them to be in. They just need to trust you, Lord. So stir in their hearts tonight, God. Fill them up in Jesus' name and help them just keep their eyes on you, Lord. Give us wisdom. Give us knowledge. Give us, give us strength to keep moving forward. Don't ever stop. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.